afternoon students i hope all of you are doing good and i hope your preparation is going fine welcome to today's analyst this is 28th of february 2024 and we are here to discuss important articles from the hindu and the indian express the first topic of today is in relation to united nations reforms the second topic is in relation to science research in india the third topic is in relation to dgca Fourth topic is in relation to the mission Gaganyaan and last but not the least is in relation to genome sequencing. Now coming on to the first topic. So moving on to the first topic. The first topic is in relation to United Nations reforms. Now our editorial has appeared suggesting reforms in United Nations. That is why it becomes very very important for us. And in relation to GS Paper 2, important international institutions, agencies, their structure and mandate, the CUN United Nations becomes very, very important. Now, before understanding various reforms which are required in United Nations, we need to understand the United Nations as an intergovernmental organization. So it was founded on October 24th of 1945 in San Francisco, California of United States. <clears throat> now, there are certain key documents which are associated with the United Nations. That is your UN Charter, which is a very famous document which you all must have heard of. Then Universal Declaration of Human Rights. Then Convention on Rights of Child and Statute of International Court of Justice. Now in relation to member states, there are close to 193 member states of United Nations. And what are the various main organs of United Nations? Again, a very, very important thing for us to know. First is UNGA, that is UN General Assembly. Second is UNSC, which is a very famous and powerful organization, United Nations Security Council. Then ECOSOC, that is United Nations Economic and Social Council. Fourth one is UN Trusteeship Council. Fifth one is ICJ, International Court of Justice. And last but not the least is UN Secretariat. So these are the main principal organs of United Nations. Now, before we understand what are the reforms which are required in United Nations, let us understand India's stance and we'll be understanding India's stance through an address which, is, which was given in the 78th UN General Assembly by our external affairs minister S. J. Shankar. Of course, he put forward India's opinion and India's point of view for a wider global role for our country and serving as a model to reform the United Nations Security Council and United Nations overall working as well. So the speech which was given by our Honorable External Affairs Minister, it dwelled into four paradigms. First paradigm was focused on diplomacy and dialogue. Second paradigm was focused on global south. Third paradigm was focused on evolution as Vishwamitra. And last paradigm was focused on social welfare for all. Let us understand each of these paradigm in relation to United Nations reforms. So first thing which our external affairs minister focused on was that India's aim was to focus on key concerns of the many in the world and not just the narrow interest of the few that is the western countries. And at a time where the deep north-south divide is very much, east-west polarization is very much, our external affairs minister suggested that the G20 summit which was held in India last year in New Delhi, it showed that diplomacy and dialogue are the only effective solutions. So these few things must be kept in mind while we are talking about UN reforms. Also a friend of the global south. Now India over the several years, over the last many years have emerged as a very deep friend of the global south. So, S.J. Shankar pointed out India's role as a friend of the Global South. For example, we had our Vaccine Maitri initiative during the COVID-19 pandemic period. Then International Solar Alliance was also a very exemplary example of where India showcased that it is a very deep and good friend of Global South. Then Coalition for Disaster Resilient Infrastructure, again to build uh, infrastructure which is resilient of the disasters and engagement in the distant regions such as the Pacific Islands. All of these initiatives so shows us that Global South should be kept in mind while we are talking about United Nations reforms. Now India's evolution as a Vishwamitra. So pushing for collective endeavors with cooperation with the diverse partners which reflects India's evolution as a Vishwamitra which is a, di which is a defining characteristic. Now this word is very important in the emerging multipolar order. <clears throat> so the word multipolar order is very, very important. So world currently is not bipolar. 
that is us and russia are not the only two dominant forces but currently the world is a multipolar one and this needs to be understood while we are talking about reforms in united nations and last but not the least is the social welfare for all now the external affairs minister he linked india's external approach to its own internal developmental trajectory that how india's internal developmental trajectory has been over the years it is in relation to external approach as well so as a very famous saying goes that your internal policy determines your external policy right so we are seeking to demonstrate that social welfare need not now this is very important it need not be the sole prerogative of just the developed world other countries the developing countries under developed countries they are also they should also have the access to resources and they are also righteous enough to have the fruits or to bear the fruits of development so again a call to the reforms in united nations it's long pending and the time has come where reforms in united nations should be starting and india will play again a very very proactive role in it now the question is what are the reforms which are required in united nations so united nations reforms are required in diverse fronts let us understand one by one each front and what are the reforms associated with it so in relation to un security council now we all know that four countries that is your brazil germany india and japan they are wanting to get permanent membership of un security council now there are few suggestions which are given first of all uh, un security council is having something known as p5 that is permanent five members now these permanent five members they are having veto power right now some of the experts they give a suggestion that either you do away with this p5 notion and you do away with this veto power or there is one more suggestion that you go on for expanding this p5 right and include other countries such as brazil germany india japan they are very big countries representing huge chunk of population and also you include some countries from the global south and then you make this p5 as p10 or p15 and then give them veto power or you do away with the veto power altogether right these are the some suggestions which are given so either you include these countries or you abolish or reform the veto power which is held by the permanent five members and also make sure that un security council global south is also represented so these are the first set of reforms under security council now in relation to un secretariat reforms in relation to transparency so un secretariat should be more transparent it should be more accountable and efficient in its functioning and how so there can be there are <coughs> some suggestions that the elections of secretary general should be done in a direct way so direct election should be there should be done by the people as what is done in the presidential system so this is one set of suggestion which is given to make it more transparent un secretariat right now certain reforms in relation to democracy as well so presidential election of a un secretary general as we saw in the previous point it should be made by a direct vote of the citizens of the democratic countries right so world presidentialism could be set up and the general assembly could also be involved in it now also one more suggestion is that combination of direct and indirect democracy in the united nations whereby national governments the national governments the member countries they might ratify the expressed will of their people so they might ratify that okay people of my country are willing to support this or not for various important posts and empowered world court so various important posts of united nations should be selected by the expressed will of the people of each country so making the process more democratic more transparent and more uh, reformative right so again these are some set of reforms which are suggested now in relation to financial stability the financial contributions from each member state should be done in a timely member and the areas the earlier existing areas should be adjusted and should be addressed there should be equitable and fair distribution of the financial contribution it should not be like some is giving some countries they are giving a non proportional higher contribution to the united nations and some are not even contributing a bit right so there should be certain equitable and fair distribution based on of course the size of the economy in relation to bureaucracy and decision making 
वन थिंग विच इज ऑफ प्रॉब्लम इन यूनाइटेड नेशन इज ओपेसिटी राइट सो ब्यूरोसी शुड बी नॉट ओपेक इन यूनाइटेड नेशन इट शुड बी मोर ट्रांसपेरेंट एंड इनफिशियंसीज शुड बी रिड्यूज इन द एडमिनिस्ट्रेटिव प्रोसेस फॉर एग्जाम्पल रेड टेपिज्म शुड बी रिड्यूज अकाउंटेबिलिटी एंड ट्रांसपेरेंसी नीड्स टू बी इंप्रूव थ्रू चेंज इन प्रोसेस एंड यूज ऑफ ई गवर्नेंस इनिशिएटिव and electronic initiative is a must in making united nations 21st century centric and of course use of artificial intelligence should also be ensured in making the functioning of united nations more and more robust so i hope this topic is very very clear to all of you now moving on to the second topic that is science based research in india now again a write up has appeared on the need of sustainable funding in the science field now in relation to general studies paper 3 science and technology this topic becomes very very important now before understanding the scientific research in india we'll be trying to understand the status of science research in india through various uh, infographics through various datas now some of these datas you might note down as well because they will be handy when you are writing your answers as well so some of the datas first is expenditure on research and development one by one i'll be telling you all the datas so keep an eye and keep a very close eye on whatever i'm seeing right so first is in relation to expenditure on research and development now as a percentage of gdp if we talk about so from 2011-12 to 2020-21 this has been the percentage spending of india on research and development r and d right so recently we seen 2020 2021 only 0.64% of the gdp india spent on research and development only 0.64% of the gdp and if we have to compare it with the other countries we can see in case of israel it spent close to 5.35% of the gdp in research and development korea it spent 4.8% of the gdp in research and development your sweden it spent 3.49% of the gdp and india is at a very very low state that is 0.64% of was a spend 0.64% of the gdp was spent on research and development which shows that research and development is not a very big priority when it when it comes to the spending part when it comes to the expenditure from the budget part right so this data set of course you should note down and this you can use in the introduction of your answers in your essays as well right now coming in relation to the women in science so gender equity and equality in science field so total staff in research and development institutions it is more than 5 lakh 54000 right so 5 lakh 54000 is the total staff in research and development institutions now out of this 5 lakh 54000 lakh 60000 or 3 lakh 61000 to be specific is a scientific staff in research and development overall it is 5 lakh 54000 if we talk about scientific staff in research and development it is 3 lakh 61000 now out of this 3 lakh 61000 2 lakh 94000 people are men and just 67000 that is the staff which is involved in research and development the scientific staff only 67000 women are involved in research and development in our country as a staff which shows that there is gender disparity in science research in india as well so there is gender disparity as well and this also you should know so only this data if you know that women constitute 67400 of the scientific staff in research and development institutions your uh, your work would be sorted so just this data you need to understand and you need to know now coming into the doctorates awarded in the science and engineering field so in relation to the doctorates awarded close to 14900 doctorates were awarded as of 2020 2021 doctorate means phd degrees right so out of those 6200 more than 6200 were in relation to the science field close to 5000 was in relation to the engineering and technology field close to 200 were in veterinary sciences 1700 were in agriculture and medicine close to 1700 now what data is important this data that is 14900 
Approx, you can say 15,000 doctorates were awarded in science and technology in 2020-2021. Now, this also we'll see a comparative analysis too, right? That how have been the doctorates provided throughout the world also, right? So, if we talk about all the doctorates which are awarded and compare it with the science and engineering based doctorates, we'll be understanding one thing that in China, 71% of the PhD degrees awarded were in the field of science and engineering doctorates. In India, the number is 59%. So, for example, if 100 PhD degrees are awarded in India, 59 of them are in the field of science and engineering. Right. But in China, if 100 doctorates, 100 PhDs are awarded, 71 of them are in the field of science and engineering. So this data you can know 59% of the doctorates awarded in India are in the field of science and engineering. I hope this is also very, very clear to you. Now, one more thing, one very, very interesting data, researchers per million population. So per million population, how many researchers a country is having? So highest here is again Israel. So Israel is having more than 8,300 researchers per million of its population. Second is Singapore, Japan, US, UK. So you see all the top countries, they are very, very far. They are miles ahead in science and technology research and development in the entire world, right? And India again comes at very last close to 262 researchers per million population, which is very, very low. Well, it's not even comparable to Israel. Israel is 8,300 researchers per million population. India just 262 researchers per million population. And population of India is also 1.4 billion people, right? Still such, so many, so less researchers in our country, which shows again that research and development in our country is not a priority. And it's not very widespread either. Okay, now in relation to the patents filed, right? Now patents are the form of intellectual property rights. Many of you would be knowing, right? Now patents, the number of patents filed, it also tells you the status of science and technology and research and development in a particular nation. Right. So from the patents, we'll be able to know that how much innovation is happening in a particular country. So in China, more than 15,85,000 patents were filed as of 2021. And in India, just 61,500 patents were filed. So 61,500 uh, 61, and China, 15,85,000 patents. In US, close to 5,91,000 patents were filed. Right. In Japan, close to 2,89,000 patents were filed. In India, just 61,573 patents were filed in 2021, which again shows the level of science and technology in our country is very, very poor. So throughout all the data which I showed to you till now, it reflects one thing, that the status of research and development the status of science-based research in India, it is at a lower strata. It is at a lower, it is at a lower place. And the situation, it's not at a very good place if we talk about science-based research in India. Now, what we need to understand is what are the some government initiatives which Indian government is taking up in order to promote research and development in the country. So, National Education Policy 2020, it is again a step at the right direction. If we talk about science-based research in India, National Research Foundation Bill of 2023, then your imprint initiative, which includes impacting research, innovation, and technology. Then your Uchatar Avishkar Yojana, again, one of the very prominent initiatives of the government of India. Then your Stuti program, that is your synergistic training program utilizing for uh, utilizing the scientific and technological infrastructure. So in relation to scientific and technological infrastructure, the Stuti program is very important. Then your PERS initiative, that is promotion of university research and scientific excellence, again, to promote your R&D. Then Atal Innovation Mission, as we know, it is very famous, Atal Tinkering Labs. Then your FIST initiative fund for improvement of science and technology, infrastructure in universities and HEIs, higher educational institutions. Then intellectual property rights regime, that is, our government is putting forward this intellectual property regimes and making the laws more stringent. 
then tax breaks to the startups who are involved in research and development science and technology then providing scholarships to the science based students under pm research fellowship again promoting them to go for doctoral research and earn phds and to ensure that they are contributing towards the research and development of the country now moving on to the next topic of today it is in relation to dgca that is director general of civil aviation now dgca is firm on implementing the new duty reforms and norms for the pilots right in relation to general studies paper to statutory regulatory and quasi judicial body since dgca is a regulatory body this topic becomes very very important now first understand what is dgca the full form is of course directorate general of civil aviation and as we know it is a regulatory body but it regulates what it regulates civil aviation in our country so it regulates the air transport services which happens to from and within india within our country right it deals with the safety issues and enforces civil air regulations ensures air safety and air worthiness standards in our country these are the primary functions which are performed by dgca let us also coordinating with the icao that is international civil aviation organization which is a specialized agency of united nations and it is a this dgca of course it is a regulatory body but it is a attached office of your ministry of civil aviation and headquarter of this dgca is in new delhi and several other regional offices are also existent and it is headed by again your director general of civil aviation right and there is one e governance initiative that is egca initiative under this dgca to promote efficiency transparency and ease of doing business through a digital platform under this dgca so this director general of civil aviation what all other departments are under them right and what all other different arenas are controlled by this dgca that we need to understand first is air transport in relation to that dgca is playing a very vital role and then personal licensing then flying training in sports aircraft certification then continuing air worthiness then aircraft operations then your aerodromes and ground aids uh, contributing towards air navigation services then training of the personals uh, legal affairs state safety programs international cooperations investigation and prevention of mishaps mishappenings surveillance and enforcement then information technology under the dgca overall administration and uavs that is unmanned aerial vehicles or unmanned aircraft systems all become a part of your director general of civil aviation operations i hope this is very very clear to all of you now moving on to the next topic of today it is in relation to gagan yan the first unmanned flight under the gaganyaan is likely to happen by this year's end now in relation to general studies paper 3 science and technology this gaganyaan becomes very very important now first we need to understand what is this gaganyaan now gaganyaan is a mix of a variety of space flight missions right and it will be india's first manned space flight mission right now some key facts which you need to understand not three but four number of crew crew members would go on a manned aerial vehicle on a manned mission on a space flight mission more than 9000 crore is the cost of the program and they'll be going on for 5 to 7 days now aim of the mission is to ensure opportunities are opened for research and development in science and technology in different areas which will include your medicine agriculture industrial safety pollution waste management water and food resource management so what will be the launch vehicle used the launch vehicle will be human rated launch vehicle that is your gslv mk3 right so this vehicle will be used and there will be two components there will be crew module and there will be service module so crew module will be the habitat of astronaut which will be going on the space and service module it will do an on orbit servicing so on orbit servicing will be done by this service module and the crew module will be the habitat of the astronaut and combining them it will be the orbital module which will be launched in the lower earth orbit now let us understand a bit more about the gaganyaan program because i told you it is a mix of several small small programs so there are steps 
in which this Gaganyaan program will progress. First of all, there will be an integrated airdrop test which will happen. Right. Then test vehicle missions will be there where test vehicles will be sent. Then pad abort test will be done right during the abortion services then unmanned flights close to two unmanned flights will be sent on space and finally there will be the manned flight which is the real gaganyan four crew members will be sent in space right and how everything will go let us understand each of the steps one by one so gslv mk3 will lift off from sriharikota in 16 minutes they will reach to the lower earth orbit and as we know now, there are two modules. There is the orbit module is there. The under orbit module, there are two modules, right? So orbit module, first of all, it will reorient, it will deboost. There will be separation of crew and service modules in the air, right? After that, there will be aero braking and a parachute deployment of the crew module, right? And, and after this parachute, this uh, this parachute deployment. Ultimately, there will be a splashdown at the Arabian Sea of Gujarat coast, right? So eventually, they will come down through a parachute. And there will be 36 minutes from the de-boost to the landing. So once this de-boost happens, after this de-boost, 36 minutes will be the time period from the de-boost period to the landing phase where there will be the crew members would be landing in the Arabian Sea of Gujarat coast, right? So this is the whole this is the whole chronology of the events which will take place in this Gaganyaan mission, right? And crew module recovery will happen in the 15 to 20 minutes time period, right? So 15 to 20 minutes time period, crew module recovery will take place, right? So this is a do boost phase. This is the descent trajectory, right? Descent trajectory. This is the ascent trajectory going from here to here. That means once the this uh, space flight mission is going up. That is the ascent trajectory. Orbit module separation will happen here, right? I hope now this Gaganyaan mission is very, very clear to you, right? Now, moving on to the last topic of today, that is genome sequencing. Now, close to 10,000 human genomes have been sequenced in India. Now, in relation to general studies paper 3, again, science and technology, this genome sequencing topic becomes very, very important. Now, before understanding this genome sequencing, it might be a bit of complicated for many of the students who are not in, from the science and technology background. But let's try to understand this genome sequencing in a simple way. First, let us understand what is a genome. So, it is made of the word gene, which you all must have heard of. And this genome, it is a set of DNA instructions which are present in human cell, right? Now, this genome... It is made up of tiny chromosomes which are there in the cell's mitochondria, right? So human cell is having a mitochondria in that there are tiny chromosomes and the genome is made of these chromosomes. And what does this genome reflect? It reflects the set of DNA instructions which are present in our cell, right? Which makes our cell a particular type, our DNA a particular type and eventually leading to our gene becoming a particular type. And 23 pairs of chromosome which are found in the nucleus of the cell, right? Now, what does this genome do? So, genome includes all the information, of course, the DNA instructions. It includes all the information which is required for a person to develop and function throughout, right? So, it includes the information which is required for the person to grow, right? So, your genome will determine what will be your height, what a disease you will be catching in future, right? what will be your skin, all, most of the things in a human body will be determined by the genome. Now, what we need to understand is what is this concept known as genome sequencing, right? So, all the organisms, whether it be bacteria, mammals or plants, they have their own genetic code that we know. The genes are present in the cell. These are the GN, uh, DNA instructions which are present in the cell, right? So, all the organisms, they are having their own genetic code or genomes, which are made of nucleotide bases. So, which is made of nucleotide bases. Now, this is very important term, nucleotide bases. So, what is this genome sequencing? Genome sequencing is a laboratory procedure. That is, it is an artificial procedure which happens in the laboratory and it determines what is the order of this nucleotide bases in genome of a particular organism, 
again i'm repeating every organism is having a genetic code or a genome that genome is a made of nucleotide bases and when we determine what is the order of those nucleotide bases in a genome of a organism in a single step we call that determination through a laboratory process as whole genome sequencing we are trying to understand the sequence of the nucleotide bases in genome of a particular organism i hope this is very very clear now what have been the various initiatives which has been launched by india of course there are world initiatives as well for example human genome project but indian projects are more important for us so first very famous indian project is indigen program indian genome program right so it was launched in the year 2019 and its aim was to undertake a genome sequencing of thousands of individuals from different ethnic groups from india so that you get to know what is the genetic type what is the genome type or the order of the nucleotide bases of different uh, different uh, ethnic group or individuals in our country it will ensure and enable genetic epidemiology in our country as well and it will develop our public health technology because we will be knowing that targetedly which set of population requires what kind of public health and what kind of targeted interventions are required so it will help in applications using population genome data now this indigen program it was endorsed by csir that is council for scientific and industrial research in our country and what are the outcomes of it utilized towards so are the outcomes of this indigen program will be utilized towards understanding the genetic diversity of our country that how diverse the genomes are there in our country amongst the individuals uh, on population scale uh, making available genetic variant frequencies right for clinical applications for clinical efficacies and enabling genetic epidemiology of diseases in our country that what kind of people are would be more prone to what type of diseases again that will be determined on the genome sequencing part because genome of an individual genes of an individual determines a lot of the human factors right now there is one more program that is genome india project now this project national project was launched in the year 2020 and it was funded by your dbt that is department of biotechnology and also super headed by your center for for brain research cbr right and what is the aim of this genome india project the first aim is to identify genetic variation in the 10000 representative individuals in our country across india using whole genome sequencing how whole genome sequencing is happening we already know so close to 10000 people's genetic variation would be identified under this genome india program now what is the aim aim first is to create a catalog of genetic variation that means to know what are the different types of genetic variations in our country different types of genomes in our country amongst different set of populations different communities also to create a reference haplotype again a kind of a dna structure for indians right to create low cost genome wide arrays for research and diagnostic so in relation to creation of haplotypes understanding your genetic variations then for research and diagnostic and development and for your healthcare improving your healthcare system for understanding and creating a biobank for dna and plasma samples for future research all these things are the things on which this project is aimed towards right so this project genome india will help in understanding the genetic variations it will help in creating a reference haplotype structure it will help in research and diagnostic it will help in creating a biobank for dna and helping in further research in this genome sequencing part as well i hope this genome sequencing indigen program and genome india program is very very clear in your mind so i hope this lecture was useful for all of you all the very best and have a very very nice day